without further ado, ado I think um, we've got Professor Bob Stone here. Thanks for your patience, Bob. I know we're a bit, bit late on uh, due to un unforeseen circumstances, but uh, we've still got a good audience. So please, Bob, take it away in your own time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Keith. And yes, and thanks for hanging on, folks. It's, uh, I'm uh, I'm presenting from a, a very sweltering caravan down in Cornwall, uh, which is quite interesting because it's in this part of the world where a lot of the projects that my team and I do in, in, in the virtual heritage arena. So it's, it's, it's good to be able to present. Um, just very, very briefly, I run a little team at University of Birmingham called Human-Based Technology Team. So my background's in human factors. I've been involved in extended reality for one of a better decision for 35 years and a lot of our work a lot of our paying work is in defense technology evaluation and, and heritage particularly bringing scenes of nature to individuals uh, who are in, who are sort of confined to hospital or, or recovering uh, but my passion has always been heritage um, ever since i was uh, a young chap pre-university going to places like dartmoor and being able to, see, well, in fact, to be able to de detect and discover things that people really didn't realize what existed there. And it wasn't until really the 1990s, the early 1990s, when I started witnessed this uh, fantastic demonstration using numerous uh, ISBN link, where there was a young lady in Paris who was giving a, a, a member of the cloth, a, a priest, uh, a guided tour of the Abbey de Cluny. And I thought to myself, this is incredible. This really is amazing that we can get people interacting in the same virtual space somewhere that never existed. And then bringing it more to sort of update-ish, in 1995, we were given 12 days to develop the demonstration you've seen on the left. Very, very simple. I mean, had it not been, had it been any other painting other than Lowry's, we, we would not have been able to do this. But being able to suck the viewer using virtual reality into uh, coming from the mill, circa 1935, in support of Salford City Council's bid for the Lowry Centre, which, as I'm, I'm sure many of you know, was, was actually very, very successful. So this is where I really got, the, got the, the, the bug for virtual heritage, if you like. And it was not until 1995, 96, that we really were able to demonstrate what virtual reality could do. And it's interesting to listen to the talks about Stonehenge. Uh, we actually built the first virtual Stonehenge along with a desktop virtual reality company called Superscape based in Aldermaston at the time, with the idea of using uh, virtual Stonehenge to show people what they're not able to see normally. In other words, you can't go up the stones because the acid destroys the lichen. So you're, you're, you're fenced off the stones. So you never get to see things like Christopher Wren's graffiti. Uh, these things, these carvings on the stones, not to mention the cursus and the avenue and all the barrows, wood henge up the road. Up the road. These are things that, that really don't uh, get exposed for, for, for ordinary people who are not in the, when they visit these sites. And we were lucky at the, uh, it was now 1996, the day before the summer solstice in 1996, uh, we were fortunate enough to team up with the late and unbelievably great uh, Sir Patrick Moore. And we presented our virtual Stonehenge and, and, and the sunrise of Stonehenge, uh, plus a fairly accurate nighttime sky, which we developed using a database from NASA um, at the London Planetarium. Each of these stones, which are based on English heritage photogrammetric sur sur um, survey, had to be re-rendered uh, into polygonal format you by hand that just goes to show you know, how, how you really have to be dedicated to virtual, her virtual heritage back in the day and then being able to convert that into something that makes the invisible visible hence the title of my talk um, so here you see the, the stone that contains the Christopher Wren graffiti you can walk around these stones you can get details from the sarstons and, and, and the, uh, the blue stones you can get their specific their specifics, but also you can bring that bring the history to life as that, you, what all the markings were, uh, particularly as I say the the, the the graffiti by by Sir Christopher Wren. So moving on to to, to 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 where I am roughly now and what we've been doing over the over the the years 2004 to the present day, and obviously I've not got the time to go into any into all of these, but. You probably gather from my accent that I'm from the West Country anyway, uh, and so we, we make some, being able to come down here and do work on Dartmoor, work in Cornwall, work in Plymouth Sound, uh, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. And, and it's great really to be able to do this because the number of people we come across, members of the public, school kids, and this is what Keith, um, the Keith entitled tonight's presentations and tonight's event is all about, making this available to inspire and engage audiences. So we've done projects from, for example, HMSA 7, bottom left, that's a, a pre-World War I submarine that, that tragically sank in all hands. The Glaucus is one of my favorite up near um, Breakwater Fort in Plymouth Sound. 
That's the, the UK's first underwater habitat that practically nobody in Plymouth knew existed. It, it's, it's in such a poor state at the moment, right through to looking for um, down Western Whirlwind aircraft uh, that, that, that crashed in Box Tormeyer in Second World War and so on and so on. So there's a whole host uh, of these projects that draw us down, <clears throat> that draw us down to West Country and uh, with the aim of engaging members of the public and carrying out STEM activities with, with, with school kids. One of the recent ones we've done before I go on to the Borough Tour project is the virtual Mayflower, right? the virtual Mayflower uh, and 1620s Barbican. And again, the, this, is, this video is available on site. We, we presented this um, back in 2020 at the anniversary, the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims sailing from Plymouth uh, over to the New World. And that involved an, an, an enormous amount of research and there was no funding for this at all, sadly. So this was a, a labor of love over quite a few years to build up a representation of Plymouth Barbican, which of course is much more structured and organized and littered with pasty shops today uh, than it was back, was back then. And I say, public engagement is what, to me, what this is all about. And you know, we, here we have the 1620 Symposium. We were lucky enough also to, to be loaned a, a smell system by an American company called VR. So we were able to uh, link the triggering of in many cases, pretty disgusting smells uh, to be released into the noses of the individuals who um, won a ticket in a lottery that we did for to come over the one weekend to be able to see the uh, the Mayflower experience and and, uh, and to engage with engage with the team. Anyway, so that's that's kind of potted history of why why we do what we do down here. Um, but I'm focusing on Baratour today, and Baratour is one of those areas that not many people really know about. Um, some of you will, will have seen Warhorse. And War Horse was first filmed around the Baratour area and the, the, the abandoned house at Ditsworthy Common. <clears throat> Lovely place. I used to go and chill there when I was doing my A-levels and we are going back to the time there. Um, but this Steven Spielberg was really drawn to, to the area around uh, Sheep Store, which you can see in the right corner of that image, and the countryside and the moorland and, and just the sheer beauty and, and, and starkness of some of the areas uh, on Dartmoor. I'm biased, obviously, but uh, it's nice to get a second, second opinion from someone such as, as, as Steven Spielberg. Now it's interesting, but the, the, the reason we were there was not to do with heritage. It was a healthcare project. It was looking at whether or not we could deliver scenes of virtual nature into hospital to help cognitive and physical rehabilitation for patients coming out of major surgery. And this in itself was, was really successful. And we chose two areas. One was a coastline area, which I won't bore you with. And the other one was, was, was Baratour, which, which never really got that far. But what we found was by modeling parts of, of Baratour, we were coming across all kinds of embedded, buried, hidden uh, pieces of heritage. That, again, talking to the locals, nobody knew it was there. Nobody knew they, they, these, things, these, these things were there. And over a period of time, we, would, we discovered all kinds of amazing, amazing artifacts from the old railway line, Baratour and Sheepstore railway line, that brought the guys who built the dam um, up from Plymouth and other areas to S3 Farm, which I'll come on to in a second, and an old suspension bridge built in 1927, and which was built in order to raise the, raise the level of the dam. And that's just a, a, a small selection of what we discovered in Baratour. And a lot of these things are hidden behind extensive rhododendrons, yeah, almost inaccessible. But people go to Baratour, they get out of their car, they buy their ice cream, they look at the water, say, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Get back into their car and they go away again. If only we could encourage them to go on almost like a treasure hunt to find these fantastic pieces of history, um, we could introduce healthcare into heritage as well, which is something that Keith and I have talked about in the past. And so, so some of the reconstruct reconstructions we got here, both done, uh, both of these done in Unity. This is the old halt uh, at Baratour and Sheep Store. Um, and it, the one, there's, a, there's a, a nighttime version, which really is amazing. It's, um, you stand on the platform and you hear a distant whistle from the locomotive, creating the illusion that you've actually missed your last train. And it really is quite a very eerie, uh, a very eerie experience. And Spitfire fly pass from RAF Harabir, which is literally just down the road. And of course, being a dam, you, we couldn't resist experimenting with some augmented reality to get the, the, the Lancaster fly over as well. So that's, that's another little thing. We use a lot of technology to help build these things. So this is, uh, again, a 14th century manor house, Longstone Manor, which is on the coastline or on the shoreline of Baratour. What you see at the bottom is a, is a PIX4D recreation of the, the remains of the manor taken using our DJI Inspire drone and converted from the video using this, this tool PIX4D. And it does actually produce a really nice, accurate 
the 3D model texture doesn't handle water and trees and what have you, but in terms of being able to get back into Unity, saves us an awful lot of time. So again, so again, another example of, of history on the Barter area, which has been there, um, that then enables that enables us to, to go out and recreate uh, the 3D models using some of the um, the geometric qualities of the uh, the data that we we've, we've got from from drone surveys, all done with permission, of course. So over ground, this is fine, but of course the, the Bart Forest is flooded valley, and we we knew from talking to people that there were things under the water. Uh, and what we want to try and do is, is to build a model, a 3D model of what Barator looked like and, and the, the path between the northern side through to the village of Sheepstore uh, before it was flooded in the late 1800s. Again, nobody knew. Everyone was talking about the flooded, the flooded village, the fact that when, it's, when there's a drought, the church spire appears with, and, and, and the church bell rings, which ultimately we discovered was complete nonsense. But we thought, well, it wouldn't it be nice if we could just find out what's down there and how it's distributed. Things like Sheepstore Bridge, Essary Farm, the path, all of these again, lost, lost the human eye uh, forever because of the reservoir. So we teamed up with a company called Space Services in Truro, based in Truro back in, uh, two, in, in uh, 2015, 2016. And we, they, uh, we again with permission deployed their autonomous surface vessel on Barator um, with, a, with a high definition multi-beam sonar. So here you can see the Barator area with Plymouth out in the distance. And you can see the area that we covered uh, using this uh, using this system. And forward up, you see, actually see the thing in action there. So uh, this, 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 this autonomous surface vessel um, went up and down uh, with the sonar, categorizing, categorizing the, um, the, uh, what was underneath. What we did then was we took the XY, XYZ point cloud from the multi-beam sonar output, put it into a global mapper, enhanced it somewhat with, paint, with Photoshop, and then took that height map, raw format, and put it into, uh, into Unity. And the thing with, with Unity is that you can then add azimuth and elevation lighting, which enables you to interpret what was down there by, by just, just changing the light and changing the shadow. And this gives you an example of what we found. So on the, the top left is a segment of that uh, of of the uh, the unity converted underwater data uh, you can see essary farm which is you can see the foundations here uh, you can even make out the old duck pond you can make out all the all of the hedgerows and the hedgerow the found, uh, foundations you can match up uh, the field boundaries with the 18 late 1800s map and you can trace uh, what was the river mevi before it was flooded sheep store bridge just there and also uh, drake's leap the famous uh, drake's leap taking water originally from the moors down into the Devonport area of, of, of Plymouth. And we've been, we've been very gradually, again, this is, this is an unfunded labor of love, but we've been building up a 3D model of all these, of all these, uh, these key areas. And just again, to show people what exists, what lies beneath and what people can't see. Now, as we were doing this, we came across some very interesting blips. This is the main dam. This is, the, this is the area where the 1920s uh, suspension bridge went across uh, the reservoir. And these, these very sort of smooth hemispherical blips that seem to go across the, incre the entire width of the reservoir. And we're not too sure what these are about. So Dartmoor Archive, always a fantastic source of data for pictures in, in, of the moor, of the moorland area in extreme weather conditions. So this is, the, um, this is one of the, uh, the 1950s droughts. And lo and behold, you can see these spheres. Uh, and these spheres, they're not small, they're about four foot in diameter, resting on what looked like chains. And we were very intrigued by this and just wondered, well, you know, is there any way we can find out what these were? Interestingly, it became very obvious quite quickly that they were torpedo nets or the remains of torpedo nets that were put in place in the 1940s to stop the Germans from torpedoing the dam. Again, nobody knew they were down there. A lot of people had passed on since then, but but there was evidence that the Germans were interested in taking this dam out and uh, flooding the valley, depriving Plymouth of its water supply, and also probably taking out the, the, the small village of the beautiful village, the village of Mevi, just down the uh, the remainder of the uh, of the River Mevi. 1941 the German reconnaissance uh, picture, and on the 19th of May 1941, this Junkers 88 uh, crashed. You can see you can see in fact the sheep store just uh, crashed on the bank of the reservoir. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the the pilots were temporarily interned in sheep's or church. But this were, these were craft that were capable of carrying um, torpedoes. 
So there is evidence that there may, may have been some interest in taking the dam out. And even today, when you go to this area, you can put your hand in, in, in the sodden earth and you can pull out electrical items, capacitors, bits of wire from that crash. It's absolutely amazing. And then we were looking at, there's a, an old lady in a world who actually gave us a, a picture, which I blew up in the 1940s. And lo and behold, you can just make out two sets of spheres on the surface. So the fact that this whole pyramid was there was absolutely amazing. And we also found discussions in the National Archives declassified, including um, minutes from meetings that involved Barnes Wallace you know, of the bouncing bomb and dam busters fame. Uh, that was, that defined, actually confirmed that for 2,200 pound, the nets were transferred from Pillar Sound where they were protecting the, the, uh, the Royal Navy ships to protect the dam at Sheepstraw. A little bit, uh, this, is, this is relatively boring, but they're, they're basically class T torpedo nets. And they consist of these four foot spheres uh, under which these chainmail nets are actually, are actually dangled. So to confirm that they were down there, uh, we deployed a couple of our uh, remotely operated submersibles, the RG sub or the blue ROV. And you can see, I mean, I, I think we were three quarters of the way through our battery power. And we came across one of the spheres here. And also you can see then underneath the net, the chainmail nets that they're actually resting on. We have a slightly better view from our little Trident uh, open, uh, tr Trident ROV, which we deployed quite recently too in, in another project. But you can see there as the sphere comes, as, as the sphere comes out of the Merck and got the attachment point. So we had actual confirmation that we were able to present to the local community that these, these um that these these artifacts were down there. We've done a second survey, but again, very limited by the turbidity of the water. But this time we went down with, with, with a more capable submersible with sonar, and you can see the curvature of some of the um, of some of the spheres there. What we're hoping to do is the next mission is to take a much smaller, much more capable uh, autonomous surface vessel um, and take it around the, this this barrier, this little barrier that exists across the uh, across the, uh, the reservoir now, and try and map out if these spheres actually still exist. The net, the chainmail nets, and the spheres exist um, from one side of where the original um, uh, the original suspension bridge was, right over to the other. And again, we, we quite enjoy presenting this to all the, the, the nearby villages at a variety of different um, uh, different venues. And I think that's, in, that, that, that's the most important message here in, in, is public engagement. A few more projects we're doing down in the area. For example, last literally last week, we were in Kipney Caves near Yelmpton in South Hams. And we would carry out Matterport scans. We, we, we were trying to do this in November, but unfortunately there were uh, horseshoe bats hibernating. Unfortunately, they were definitely not there this time. And we're also trying to get from the caves uh, through one of the under, underground uh, flooded passages and see if we can trace that out to the River Yelm. We weren't successful this time, but we're going to try and have another go. And also, um, as part of the, the, the Plymouth National Marine Park uh, project, we were carrying a, a scan, and again, 3D scanning using the Matterport in Garden Battery, which is uh, built in 1862, finished in 1863, uh, originally had nine inch muzzle loading cannons, but again, we're experimenting with augmented reality to show people what the cannons, the size of the cannons relative to the relative small nature, the small construction nature of, the, um, of, of this installation, which you can see on Plymouth Sound uh, as, you're, as you're coming across on what's known as, as, as the Cremel Ferry. And the two other projects that we're doing, um, again, again, related to local engagement and, and participation by public and school kids, getting elderly people to check their boxes, their shoe boxes, their shoe boxes things that may be underneath the bed uh, before they pass away and all of these wonderful ha heritage assets are chucked out. Willow Court Farmhouse is, uh, goes back, goes back as, uh, as far as Catherine of Aragon. has got some very interesting connections. And, and, and the work we're doing with, with Seven Valley Railway using a virtual reality reconstruction of a Great Western Railway carriage a compartment. And you can just make out the GoPro, so GoPro cameras on both sides of the, um, the old Great Western carriage, carriage from, uh, from Kidderminster to Bridge North. Uh, so we're trying to merge video with the three-dimensional model of the carriage. And we're gonna be presenting that in care homes in the Kidderminster area initially, where there are a number of um, ex-workers of the, of the railway in that area. So again, another example of healthcare from heritage. I, mean, I do believe that her virtual heritage enable, will enable people to get out, walk, and learn much more about their surroundings uh, than, 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 than virtual reality alone.
to say public engagement and outreach is, is absolutely central to what we do. Okay? It, it, we're not going to be millionaires uh, by doing virtual heritage, that's for sure, I'm convinced by that, but we are going to uh, help educate and engage an awful lot of people, including these lovely folks, and this is the beautiful village of, of, of Meavy with the Royal Oak Pub. If you ever run that area, for goodness sake, go and visit, it's gorgeous. And these are the people that we presented um, the, 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 uh, the, the Barter Reservoir Torpedo Nets project to, and you can see they're all very, very grateful that the, the, the Germans never took the dam out and washed this beautiful village away. Thank you very much. Amazing, Bob. Um, thanks so much for that. And um, great to, um, you know, put that in, in the time slot there as well. I know, uh, you know, it's quite delayed. So brilliant. 